Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services, a moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, July 29th. We are joined today by the Yukon Premier, Sandy Silver, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. We also have with us André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate, who will translate any questions from French-speaking journalists. Our sign language interpretation is being provided by Mary Thiessen. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have one question plus one follow-up. Premier Silver? Thank you very much, Pat. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in today. Uh, it's great to be here with Dr. Hanley on the traditional territory of the uh, Kwan Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. We have been in phase two of our Path Forward plan uh, for four weeks now. Uh, residents of British Columbia and the territories have been able to travel here uh, without the need to self-isolate. Equally important, Yukoners have been able to travel to British Columbia and uh, return without the need to self-isolate as well. This has allowed Yukoners to travel again uh, and to visit friends and family. We know how important social connections are to maintaining mental wellness, and we know Yukoners have many strong connections to the good people of British Columbia. Phase two also saw changes uh, that allowed for gatherings of up to 50 people outside. This has been especially welcoming uh, during the summer months, uh, allowing people to reconnect, even if the uh, weather has not always necessarily cooperated. Uh, our government and Dr. Handley's team uh, have been uh, monitoring the situation over the past few weeks and uh, things have been going very well. Uh, we have seen no new cases in the territory since we began phase two. Uh, just uh, to give you an idea, we have had over 30,000 incoming travelers to the territory since the end of April, beginning of May, including over 13,400 travelers in transit through the territory. And again, no new cases. This would not be possible without individuals doing their part to take the precautions in order to protect themselves and their friends, families, and neighbors. We continue to investigate complaints uh, about people not following the orders that are in place. As of yesterday, we received 437 complaints, uh, sorry, 467 complaints, mostly related to uh, out-of-territory travelers and individuals self-isolating. Despite the requirements to stay on the designated routes, uh, we are still seeing a few uh, transiting uh, vehicles uh, uh, in, in parts of our territory uh, where they shouldn't be. Uh, it is an offense to leave the designated route. We uh, and appreciate that there are legitimate reasons for some vehicles uh, with out-of-territory plates to be here, which is why we have issued uh, decals for uh, the identification of these vehicles. Uh, we have issued uh, approximately uh, 103 visitor decals uh, since we launched them last week. I am uh, sure that uh, uh, Yukoners have started to see them uh, in towns, and I hope uh, that uh, this will also uh, be eased up and ease some of the concerns. I want to thank those who have contacted uh, con uh, the enforcement team and encourage people to continue to do so. We need to remember to be respectful of all those who are in our territory. Uh, if you have concerns, please call the enforcement lines so that we can follow up. Uh, we are expecting an announcement from the Canadian Border Services Agency. Uh, we were told uh, by tomorrow, uh, definitely this week, about increased efforts on the Canadian-U.S. borders uh, in the upcoming days. Uh, we spoke to the Prime Minister of Canada today about exactly that, and we assume to get an announcement from Canada tomorrow. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Yukoners for continuing to practice the Safe Six. Uh, this continues to be the best way that we can individually contribute uh, to the efforts of keeping our territory uh, healthy and safe. We are in a good position in the territory, and if we continue to take precautions, we can keep it that way. On Saturday, August the 1st, we will begin Phase 3 uh, of our Path Forward plan. The first change people will see related to, uh, is related to organized events, and uh, Dr. Handley will, uh, will speak uh, to that in, uh, in, in more detail. Uh, we will continue to take a gradual and measured approach to lifting restrictions uh, guided by epidemiology. We need to keep a close eye on what is happening in other parts of Canada so that we can react appropriately uh, to keeping Yukoners safe. 
we can also learn from what is uh, happening in other jurisdictions. We have uh, seen what happens when people let down their guard and do not take things, things seriously uh, and do not take seriously the need to maintain physical distancing and, uh, and avoid large gatherings uh, indoors. Uh, recent events in the Okanagan, in Alberta, and elsewhere uh, should give us all pause and serve as a reminder that we are not out of the woods yet. When we enter Phase 3 on Saturday, uh, we will continue to require Canadians from provinces other than British Columbia and the two territories to self-isolate for 14 days when they arrive in Yukon. This restriction will only be lifted once Dr. Hanley is confident that the risk is significantly load, lowered based on the spread of COVID-19 in those provinces. Now, within Yukon, however, we will continue to ease restrictions that are in place, including uh, around uh, social events. Uh, I, we are also in a position to allow a return of organized sports. I will let Dr. Hanley explain those changes, uh, but it's good news for Yukoners. Uh, good news that hockey is back this fall, not just the NHL, but also here in Yukon. Uh, just like uh, rec uh, reconnecting with friends and family is important for mental wellness, so too is being active and playing sports. As we prepare to return to these routines, we need to keep in mind uh, that the safe six applies at all times, uh, including on the rink and out in the field. The safe six uh, applies everywhere. Uh, it's not just in Whitehorse, uh, where there's lots of people around, uh, that you need to keep your social distance uh, from others limited uh, in, in limiting those social gatherings. The recommendations to stay two meters apart and limit the number of people in your circle is the same for people in all Yukon communities. I know it is difficult and we all find ourselves in situations uh, where, uh, where this is difficult, but it's very important uh, that it's not specific just to being in Whitehorse. Uh, we have heard some very concerning uh, reports of larger gatherings in communities uh, despite the recommendations. Uh, please hear me when I stress that this is the riskiest behavior. Uh, close contact at a shared dinner or visiting in a large room is where a lot of spread of COVID-19 in provinces has occurred. I know it is not easy, but it's incredibly important, not just for your own sake, but for the safety of your family, uh, neighbours and the rest of our community. You may feel very safe in your small community or in your family circle, but consider how many of the people you are gathering with have recently travelled out of your community to get groceries or to visit other relatives. Uh, consider how many uh, of your family members are going to work in offices with other people who are not in your close circle, for example. So I strongly urge all Yukoners to continue to practice the safe six, maintaining physical distance, washing your hands frequently, stay at home if you're sick, limit the number of people in your gathering, travel respectfully throughout the territory, and self-isolate when required. As we continue down our path forward, please know that uh, your government is, is making uh, support available. Uh, businesses can still access support programs for fixed costs to, to be cover those fixed costs. And to date, our government has issued over $4.5 million in support with this program for local businesses. Uh, wage top-up options are available for those making less than $20 per hour. We have uh, announced further support for Yukon's aviation industry to help uh, keep those companies operating. Sick leave options uh, are available if you uh, do become ill or if you need to self-isolate. And mental wellness supports are available, just a phone call away. This is very difficult times that we're in, uh, so f for many reasons. Uh, so please reach out uh, if you would like to talk to someone. And please check in on those that are around you as well. We have to keep up our spirit, our resilience, and our creativity in these difficult times. And Yukoners, uh, you are very well suited to, uh, to manage through this situation. So please continue to take care of yourselves and to continue to take care of others. Uh, thank you very much for listening today, uh, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. Good afternoon, et bon après-midi. On Saturday this week, we will enter phase three of Yukon's Path Forward. And as both the Premier and I outlined last week, this will be a phase of slow and measured steps as we progress along the transition to new normal. As we said last week, 
due to increases in COVID activity, both in BC and many other provinces, I don't feel ready to recommend further relaxations on self-quarantine orders at this point. I will come back to this later, but for now, our focus is on making changes to our own ability to socialize and gather. Phase three therefore begins with the ability to expand our social bubbles a little more. In mid-May, we announced that you could bubble with one other family with whom you would not have to maintain physical distance from. Now we are relaxing that two household bubble slightly so that you can now increase that bubble size by up to as many as three to five families as long as you keep the total numbers in the bubble small. And by small, I'm talking about 10 to 15 people. For some people, they may need to stick with two families if these are larger families, but for smaller groups, that can mean an expansion. It's important to keep your bubble consistent in order to keep it safe. Reduced mingling and mixing of people is what helps us reduce the chance of someone getting sick from COVID-19 and spreading it to others. It also means that we can track exposures and contact trace more quickly and more efficiently if someone gets sick. Phase three also means some changes to how we can gather. Social gatherings in private dwellings remain at 10 indoors and social gatherings remain at 50 outdoors as long as appropriate and safe spacing can be maintained. These gatherings, when they involve members outside of your social bubble, do though mean that you have to maintain that physical spacing. So no change there. But the big difference in phase three is the introduction of guidelines for organized seated events. This would permit an event to take place indoors with up to 50 people, as long as it is seated with assigned seating and of course physically distanced. These kinds of events could include a wedding, a celebration of life or other cultural events, as long as participants are seated and not mingling. Again, it's the mingling and mixing is what concerns me, but with appropriate guidance, which we will soon have online, events such as these may take place. The limit for these types of events outdoors will be increased to 100. We will also accept and review plans for events that involve larger groups reviewing them for adherence to public health measures, including consideration for seating and spacing, sanitation, supervision, seating, and serving of food. This means that with proper planning, a variety of ceremonial, entertainment, or cultural events could also resume in some form. Along with cultural events come sporting events. So, we will be meeting with major sports organizations in Yukon to discuss how return to play for Yukon athletes can happen this winter. I don't have a lot of details to share today, but I do want to tell you that hockey will happen this summer, soccer will happen, sorry, so hockey will happen this winter as well as soccer. Physical activity is of course just as important, if not more so than it ever was. But as with, as with everything we've been doing with our COVID response, we're looking to others and making plans that suit our needs here in Yukon and moving slowly in a way that we hope will assure stability and not require us to go back from where we were. Many national sports organizations are working through details of what play could look like. Many involve either full or modified play with reduced numbers of contacts. For example, hockey might be with a few teams instead of full league hockey. We're actively following development of guidance around the country in these areas. We've heard from many musicians that musicians need to play and people need to hear music, and I couldn't agree more. Like others, we've been concerned about the risks posed by bars, and we've all seen recent evidence of how bars can be high-risk settings for COVID transmission or exposure, whether in the US or nearby in BC. However, once more, it all comes down to how people mix and congregate and how well these settings are supervised. We're very pleased overall with the compliance shown by restaurants and bars with their adherence to orders and guidelines. 
by and large, our venues have shown themselves to be low-risk places. So we will, as of August 1st, be allowing live music in bars with certain measures in place to ensure that the music keeps its distance and that congregation around the music or dancing is still unfortunately not allowed. We've done very well with our BC bubble pilot project, even in the face of recent increased activity in BC, particularly in the interior. This does mean a higher risk, and it has meant more people coming forward for investigation as possible contacts. We are living already with higher COVID risk, yet we have had no case introductions into Yukon at all since we opened to BC almost a month ago. So far, so good. However, it is inevitable that we will from time to time see one or two or ten or more cases of COVID-19 in Yukon. While other jurisdictions are seeing a resurgence of cases now, we're very unlikely to be exempted entirely. A new case or cluster here in the territory that, that is contained will not change our lives and will not change risk to the public, but the risk of exposure is always there. A handful of cases involving individuals who were doing the right thing, who were following public health direction, who were not in contact with a lot of people, whose contacts have been traced, will not change our lives except maybe to remind us that COVID is easily transmitted, is often around the corner, and that we need to continue to practice that safe six. Our hospitals are prepared should someone require hospitalization. Our health centers in rural Yukon are prepared to respond and support individuals who may be diagnosed and recovering at home in a community. And as ever, our public health teams remain ready and in action with uh, case identification um, and contact tracing as required. We've prepared as much as we can and we have all the systems in place to continue to support the COVID response. Our focus once into phase three will be to continue to monitor, monitor COVID activity in the country very closely and to prepare for the future when we will be able to move away from enforced self-isolation. As we do so, we will depend on all Yukoners to do the right thing when they travel, when they return, and whenever you get together with others. When you do travel out of Yukon, consider yourself wherever you go at risk of exposure. Be very aware of where you have been. If you have any symptoms that match the self-assessment criteria, do call and get tested. Staying away from others while sick is a critical part of our protective measures, especially when associated with travel outside Yukon, which remains our key risk for COVID exposure. Next week, you'll hear more about the Canadian Index of Wellbeing Survey. This is a chance to hear directly from Yukoners about how things are going during these incredibly challenging times and what we as government can do to improve well-being across the territory. With strong participation in this survey, we hope to be able to make evidence-informed decisions about future phases in the COVID-19 response. The data we collect through this survey will identify our strengths and it will also identify areas where we have challenges to work through. And with sufficient participation, data at community level will also be available for communities to help us work together on priorities for strategic planning and next steps in the pandemic response. Meanwhile, as we head optimistically into some welcome warmer weather, stay safe, stay with the safe six, travel and hunt wisely. Be sensitive to where you are. And as always, keep your kindness with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. We'll move now to the phone lines, and we'll start with Jackie Hong, Yukon News. Hi. Um, I was wondering, in regards to the seated events, um, whether people will be required to present plans or anything like that, or um, if hosts can just have these events as long as everyone is spaced out properly. Yeah, it's a it's a good question, uh, Jackie. So, and what we're I think we're trying to, in general to look at is 
is moving gradually away from event by event reviews towards more kind of uh, templates, um, uh, almost similar to how we have workplaces um, adhere to guidelines, but without requiring them to um, have those guidelines inspected before um, before they were putting them in place or, or reopening uh, as it applied. So the same kind of thing applies to these organized gatherings. We will have um, published guidelines and accessible guidelines, which will really say that these are the key requirements. And then if you can do this, then, then go ahead um, without having specifically to review. But where we will be looking for reviews will be, um, as I mentioned, those involving larger numbers. So let's say you're, you're planning an indoor gathering. It might be uh, 75 people instead of 50, but you have you think you have sufficient space in the building and sufficient organization to make that, you know, maybe similar to a large workplace where you've got everything worked out. Then those are the ones that we want to see and review so we can specifically guide and advise. And the same, uh, the same might apply to facility plan. Let's say you have um, a large facility like a community center um, and you have ideas about how you would host events within that facility, then you might, you might uh, submit an, a facility plan that we can then review and then that would kind of bind the, the, the owner of the facility, whether that's the community or a private organization, to have those um, to have those plans applied to anyone that's renting the facility. Thank you. Uh, follow up, Jackie. Um, and in regards to sports, um, I know I respect the meetings have just sort of started, but I'm wondering if you could give us a better idea of what's being discussed and whether any other sports besides hockey and soccer will be back. For sure. There, I mean, really, if you think of any organized sport that, that wants to resume, then we will, we want to support that. And most of these organized, um, you know, this could be uh, skating, uh, figure skating, curling, um, any of these organized team activities, basketball. Um, so you name it. And, and, and in most of these cases, there are already um, uh, guideline, national guidelines produced by the national organizations, either, either written or in evolution. And then it's a really uh, matching the guidelines to wherever we are in our, in, our local, um, in our local phase and then making sure we have the right conversations to support uh, the right level of play um, for that sport. Thank you. We'll move to Philippe, CBC. Are you with uh, us, Philippe? Yes, I am. I'm over here. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question would be for the Premier. I wonder, um, will there be an allocation of extra resources to schools to help deal with uh, the new measures uh, that they need to uh, be doing? This was asked by uh, Association of um, Councils and School Boards. Uh, whether any department needs extra funding, whether it be COVID-related or otherwise, uh, then that would go through a process where, uh, for cabinet approval, and that's where we would expect that conversation. Uh, the, health, the health and safety guidelines for schools, uh, you know, were, were released uh, this week, and uh, the department is supporting the schools to develop individual operating plans if we have an, uh, a, a need for extra spending. Uh, usually departments can cover costs internally unless there's uh, extra uh, costs based upon uh, circumstances that they didn't uh, calculate for in, in their original uh, budget appropriations. So that process, whether it be COVID related or, or not, uh, is the reason for things like supplementary budgets. Follow up question, Philippe? Yes, on schools, how committed are we to the current school plan, especially half days? Uh, how long would it be before this is reassessed to a full school day? And what would be the circumstances for returning to school as normal? Uh, so thank you for the question. And again, we're very pleased uh, that students uh, are able to return to class next month. That's extremely important. Um, you know, everything that we do is, is with the safety of the students in mind. Um, 
The Department of Education has been working with education partners to ensure the face-to-face -face classes will resume for the upcoming uh, school year. And I want to thank them uh, for their work. Uh, education is, is extremely important. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the teams have shown uh, great resilience to adapt to this unprecedented situation. Uh, we'll continue down the process of, uh, of, of engaging with the Chief Medical Officer of Health as far as recommendations for how we can return to a, a state of normal, uh, whether that be with our businesses or with our schools. Uh, again, not facing a, a normal year um, in, in that planning process, um, and we will continue to engage and continue to make sure that we uh, monitor the situation to maximize the amount of face-to-face uh, -face educational hours, uh, the amount of hours in the day that, that the students are in the schools, uh, and making sure that we uh, do so with, uh, with the students, uh, you know, with the students' health and safety most at mind. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim from CKRW. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for the Premier, and I've asked you this before, and hopefully you can give me an answer here. Just in regards to overall COVID spending, I know you've said previously you budgeted in the range of 37 to $40 million, but my question is how much have you spent so far? Uh, so those are the, the values that have been uh, given out in public as far as all of the different uh, programming. Uh, I don't have an up-to-date uh, number about how subscribed those numbers are right now. Uh, and again, we just finished uh, negotiations with the federal government on restart numbers. Uh, you have to remember as well, Tim, that those are uh, initiatives for for businesses and for people uh, that are struggling, uh, sick leave provisions, those types of things. There's still other costs as well through health and social services, making sure that they have uh, the proper PPEs, uh, testing and tracing and getting those tests back in a timely manner. Those are all costs that are over on top of the the 40 million that we spoke to, uh, which is dedicated specific programming. Uh, again, uh, these numbers have been available. Uh, you know, the, the 40 million is broken down into a, a number of different uh, initiatives, and uh, the Department of Health and Social Services has been doing well uh, with federal transfers as well, uh, federal money coming in in different tranches, but also uh, being able to uh, to accommodate with inside their appropriations now. Uh, so uh, I will try my best to get a, a, a a number as far as how well those programs have been subscribed to. Uh, we're pretty proud of the sick leave provision that uh, the nation, the, the federal government, has adapted into a national program for those who want. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the, the fixed cost of 30000 a month is something that is not offered in any other jurisdiction. Uh, this is what we are able to do because we did balance our budget. We came in this year with a surplus of around uh, $5 million or there around. And, uh, and being able to be in a good financial position allowed us to offer more uh, relief to the business community. Uh, when you take a look at the specific costs to our health and social services, those costs will be paralleled, uh, you know, on a per capita basis uh, uh, right across the nation. Uh, but again, it's a little bit harder to get testing done in the north, and there's some northern specific uh, reasons why we'd have a little bit more of a cost here. And uh, we're, we're very happy that the federal government has acknowledged that for all of the three territories, and we are negotiating right now for the second leg, I guess you can say, of the restart money, uh, which will help us to identify those specific costs to health and social services. Thank you. Follow-up question, Tim? Yeah, uh, this question is for Dr. Hanley. Uh, just as we're heading into hunting season and the fall quickly approaching, uh, is there any specific concerns? Do you have a message for hunters? Because, you know, they may think, well, we're in the middle of nowhere and there's no COVID here, but do you just want to maybe speak to hunters and your message for them? Sure. So uh, again, to quote um, my counterpart in BC, Dr. Bonnie Henry, bring your travel manners with you. And that includes deference to the communities and, and making sure that you're aware if you're near or approaching or in a community that you are aware of what that community's wishes are. And those are best um, placed uh, or found on the CYFN website where they have collected all of the community um, advice that, that is coming from any particular community. That's one thing. I think the second thing is if you're sick, put off your plans. Uh, so don't, you know, don't go out if you're, if you're um, already harboring uh, symptoms. It's, uh, it wouldn't be a good thing uh, if you did happen to have been exposed and, and, and are sick and in, the, in some remote area that you would have to come back from. 
and uh, otherwise, if you're hunting with with others, if they are not in your um, social bubble, then um, make sure that you're that you have provisions for maintaining the the spacing and the other requirements of the of the safe six. Um, and uh, yes, be just just um, be you know appreciate the beauty while you're out there and, and have a great time. But but be wise and uh, be thoughtful and considerate of of others, including communities. Thank you. We'll move now to Gabrielle Whitehorse Star. Hi. Are there any avenues of enforcement? Or, or follow up, even if planned events take place that are, say, above 50 people, but guidelines aren't followed or, or aren't enforced by event organizers. Yeah. So these fall uh, under under orders, at least uh, so far. Uh, and again, we may see a future where. Um, where we, if we move away from um, this under order, then we're relying more on uh, existing civil um, c civil orders or um, and and public compliance. But for the moment, uh, yes, they would be uh, they would be subject to um, prob more likely a complaint based. Uh, you know, if things didn't go uh, well, um, and uh, and uh, enforcement. Um, uh, people were to uh, to hear about it, or if we heard about it through public health, then uh, we would at least um, um, come back to the uh, to the organizers um, and with with um, appropriate um, appropriate measures. However, they're applied to that case, but but I think it would also be um, you, you know we're relying on on trust uh, as well and uh, and on the experience. If 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 we do well with this, it obviously. Uh, if one organization does well, it allows us to um, to approve other other organizational efforts. So in that way, everyone's helping each other by doing the right thing. As well, um, adding to that as well, that um, if you do have concerns about social gatherings, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know the amount of complaints that we've had so far on on our two different lines. We have a phone line of one eight seven seven three seven four zero four two five, and also the email at covid nineteen the number nineteen uh, enforcement at gov.yk.ca. Uh, both of those things are available at yukon.ca as well. Um, we've had, as I mentioned, uh, 467 uh, different complaints to those lines. Uh, and when it comes specifically to a failure to uh, to sell to uh, sorry to gatherings, uh, you know, so far the number of complaints there have been 15. Uh, more of the complaints were on the uh, on the failure to self isolate perspective. But again, the importance of those lines and that communication it's it, uh, it's extremely important that if folks uh, have any questions or concerns that they that they call these numbers or or this email address uh, and and go for it, go go through the process that way. And of course, uh, you know, putting information is complete can be completely anonymous if you want. Thank you. Follow up question, Gabrielle. Yes, but also wondering about the guidelines for live music, the no congregating or dancing. Are those rules specific to bars, or will outdoor events with live music have more leniency? Yeah, those are, that that will be specific to bars, um, and we have already allowed um, uh, um, busking, for instance, uh, live music at the, at uh, community markets, at least at the fireweed uh, market. So, um, if there are, um, and I think others would be m uh, more or less event based. So, if someone is um, wanting to organize again a, a, an event, a cultural event that involves music. Um, then, uh, then we, we would certainly have similar provisions in place um, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Silver. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. And thank you, everyone, for your time today.